Welcome to the Emporium, my name's Bubba. Today we have the biggest box of the 2021 season and we're gonna be hand delivering this two hours away to Always Evolving Python's Miguel Garcia. And you're gonna be able to see that unboxing on his YouTube channel. The co-pilot is ready to go, right? Good boy, speak, speak. What's up, y'all? We just dropped off the box over at FedEx for Miguel, and we're gonna go and head back home. We got this little guy. <laughs> Catch you guys on the flip. We just got back here into the Emporium, and today I'm just gonna be jumping straight into it. We're hitting leopard geckos. We're gonna teach you how to keep them, what we do here at the Emporium, and we're gonna give you multiple different ways to keep them. These are some of the tubs that we use, and we have a dirty little leopard gecko in here that we need to clean. I'll explain a little bit about how we set these guys up, and I wanted to show you what it looks like when these animals get dirty. I'm not here to just show you clean bins. I'll also show you what it's really like to do all of this. Without further ado, let's get straight into it. All right, leopard geckos, what are they? How do I keep them? And how do I breed them? Leopard gecko, we do have Bubba's Tips online where you can go and make sure you have just the basic necessities. There's multiple ways on how to keep these. We're not gonna tell you how to keep them. We're gonna teach you how to meet the requirements for your specific animal. How you do it, that's your problem. This here is how we do it at the Emporium. These are VE35s, the vision tubs. Uh, let me get my handy dandy uh, measuring tape. These are gonna be 15 inches wide, 20 inches deep. That's gonna give them an area of about 300, I believe, 300 square inches. So a normal 20 gallon tank is only gonna be around 288 square inches when it comes to floor space. And floor space is very important for leopard geckos. As you know, they are not uh, arboreal, they're terrestrial animals. These guys hail from Afghanistan mainly, and we're gonna show you guys how we keep them here in captivity and what we found to be works best for us. And not only us, I mean us as a family, the leopard geckos. Um, the biggest thing I can preach to you is read your animal. Learn how to read your animals. This right here is a humid box, custom printed by my little brother, actually. These will be available soon. We'll be unveiling those as soon as possible. And as you can see, it's one of her favorite spots. She's given us four eggs this year, and this is a messy tub. These guys stay locked and loaded. She doesn't really kick out too much Eco Earth, as you guys can see, but also she's laid four out of four healthy eggs in here. Look at her, beautiful animal. So what we're gonna go ahead and do while I'm coaching you through this is clean her tub, show you guys exactly how I do that, um, how I sanitize and what exactly goes into setting up um, an enclosure for an animal that I keep in tubs, that I keep in racks and how I do it properly. We already touched about the size aspect as I'm already getting and not keeping these guys in six quart tubs into their adulthood. Six quart tubs are really only used for growing out babies and ensuring their survival. Um, it's really easy to breed these guys. Um, it's really easy to get overwhelmed when it comes to babies because they do produce a lot and they're really prolific. Next up, we just have um, this stuff that usually gets pulled out first too. This is just gonna be foliage, a little bit of enrichment for these guys and um, a little bit of kind of like a natural um, shade for them to interact with. They can get up on under in it and kind of feel like more safe and stuff like that. Uh, it's not too important. It's just like, I don't, it looks good for me. The animals seem to enjoy it. And I get a kick out of not seeing just bare tubs, you know. Um, I keep these because I enjoy them, but also because I think I can help. And leopard geckos started this for me. So I'm not just going to give up on these guys, you know. These are our bulls. 
So as you can see, we do keep water in. This is a used bowl, so all these worms are gonna get tossed. I don't recycle worms. Um, I gut load and I make sure to gut load a day or two before I feed, make sure all of that uh, insects are potentially maxed out to the optimum level for, I'm trying to sound super scientific, but basically I'm just gut loading these things so that they get all their nutrition that they need. So right here we have a little third dish. My brother also 3D prints these and we'll be unveiling some new stuff soon. Um, so amazing, this stuff works so awesome for them. And as you can see, for supplementation, B pollen, calcium, plus D3, uh, we just put a little powder there and they self-regulate. Leopard geckos are awesome. So as you can see, this is the extent of this time and this female, she's a clean freak. Um, this is what it looks like. This is about three days of me not touching this tub. Uh, I was busy at the expo and now I'm back and getting into it. I'm gonna clean, but this is probably one of the easier substrates to use because also in the adult rack, everybody has a humid hide. These are lay boxes, but I also have humid hides made out of Tupperware and et cetera, you know? We'll get into that after I set them up, what that does, um, what the hides do, the temperature gradient, everything. Let's go ahead and clean this tub. So you see all of that, you wanna knock off all that excess. And some of that stuff's not gonna come off. So what you wanna do, this is what we use to sanitize and make sure your mixtures are not expiring because if you sit there and you don't have a lot of animals and you leave this mixed, it will not disinfect at a given point. I think it's about like three months shelf life once mixed. But chlorhexidine, uh, I put little, I think it's like a milliliter into one of these and fill it up all the way, mix it up thoroughly and it's uh, disinfectant. It's veterinary grade and I hit my tongs with this. I hit my hands with this at this ratio. It won't sting your hands. Um, just be careful. We also use steam cleaners. We also use um, green soap for some of the tools that we just use. Um, but when it comes to animals, you really wanna be safe and making sure you're not using anything toxic like uh, bleach and not taking care of it all the way. Um, vinegar is also good for uh, water stains, but this stuff honestly is, this is our choice, chlorhexidine. And you can find that online, Amazon, or like ask your local horse girls, they'll know where to find it. It looks like this. Sorry. This. Bow, there's a bunch of it. Um, you really won't go through it all that much, but make sure, like I said, that you stay on top of your shelf life for those. So you wanna make sure this all dries. It can air dry or you can wipe it off. That's also a benefit to having this because you can spray something, leave it, come back to it, it's air dried, it's disinfected. So what we're gonna go ahead and do is, did this the wrong way, I need to cut one of these. So we'll go ahead and cut here, but I'll show you exactly what we're doing once we get back. Bam, magic. Other suitable substrates would be non-adhesive shelf liner, paper towel, uh, newspaper, but newspaper tends to bleed ink. Um, this stuff is just craft paper, um, kind of wrapping for meats and stuff like that without the wax lining, um, et cetera. So this is important where we're placing the lay box. So as the tubs go into the rack, this back strip right here is going to be hit by heat tape, four inch heat tape. And that's gonna get this spot right here, just this line around 91 to 92 degrees. So that means over here, it could be like 88 to like 87. And then when it comes all the way down to the front, it should go down to the low 70s. And make sure you use your temp guns, get that straight. The lay box, this positioning really is important. If you put it on the cold side, it's going to lead to respiratory infections because Cold and humidity doesn't mix. You want it to create it like a sauna. So when you go in there, oh yeah, I got that nice sauna. Yeah, Joe Byron. Basically, you're just gonna go shed, have an awesome shed and everything is gonna come off and everything's A-OK. -okay. This, another little 3D printed thing that we're tossing in the back there. Another hide, 
Sorry, girl, I didn't know you were in there. Another hide, this is going to be just another spot for them to get away, get different temperature variants. And then we like to kick this one back a little. These guys also get a little bit of foliage. Not only does it look nice for me, but it also gives them a little bit of enrichment. These guys aren't the smartest animals, but uh, we're doing a lot of research. We're still innovating these things. We've only been doing this for 40, 50 years. Um, it's really not a long time when, it, when you think about dogs have been domesticated for over the past like centuries, you know? So this is going to get refilled and basically put back here. We're gonna top up some supplements as she's breeding and she's about ready to go back into one of her favorite spots. I think we hit that really well and under 10 minutes. So I really like that. If you guys have any questions, we'll get to it. Another thing I wanna to touch on real quick is softwares. We use Husbandry Pro and every animal has their own individual QR code. We're able to scan this. Um, if an animal is maybe not laying properly, um, had dud eggs paired, I'm able to record that uh, with just a snap of a picture and it's really amazing. Um, shout out to the guys at Husbandry Pro for that. It's literally on everything. We also have little whiteboard spots. Um, I work as a team here at the Aporium. Lex helps me out a ton. So if she sees something, she writes it down here. I throw it into Husbandry Pro. Um, she'll write the pairings and stuff like that. Some stuff we don't toss under Husbandry Pro, but stuff like snakes, if they miss a food, they regurge, I'm able to scan those little barcodes and record all that data and information. All these animals, uh, if I forget something, I have a terrible memory, Husbandry Pro has my back. All right, and this is what it looks like in the rack. She's ready to go, she's cleaned. She has a fresh bowl of mealworm supplementation, calcium and D3. There is a myth going around that they can overdose on D3, so some people don't give calcium with D3. However, for them to actually overdose on D3, they would have to impact themselves on the sheer amount alone. So theoretically, it's impossible. Make sure you have D3 in your calcium supplementation. And another thing we like to add in there is spirulina and bee pollen. Uh, this isn't hit over here, but this is actually gut loaded into the millworms and we'll actually sprinkle a little bit on there if we think that female needs some. She's doing excellent and she's been eating her calcium really well and she hasn't shown me any other signs of needing extra bee pollen or spirulina. So she's good to go. Thank you guys for watching and tuning in and sticking through till the end. I really hope you guys learned something today. Yumi and I are about to go outside and get some natural UVA and UVB rays, but I know in the comment section, I'm gonna get, what about bioactives? Honestly, I've never attempted it and it's really hard to replicate a naturalistic environment like that. If you wanna see me do it in the future, leave a comment below, maybe I'll try it out. But for now, this is how we keep them and thank you for tuning in. We'll see you on the next species.